Hello, this is DK. Welcome to the Wheel Print Podcast, created to uncover the inside game of adaptive athletes, their untold stories of what drives them and what makes them tick. So be prepared to be amazed as we discover the trials and the triumphs of the human spirit. Enjoy this episode. Print Nation, this is DK, and I am the host of the Wheel Print Podcast. Today is a great day. I want to welcome you as a listener. This guest is a close friend, and I think I start every podcast with those six words. But when I say that this time, I want to express that this dude is really a close friend he's married to pippa who i love who's from great britain that's his gold medal uh he has a strong wheel print of experience over decades of of involvement in adaptive sports was a competitor chose his education and career in adaptive involved in programming, uh, became a USA national team coach, became a international professional coach for Great Britain. And that means, baby, that he's bringing in some ducats <laughs> and is an author. Rather than list all these things in detail in this intro, I'm going to cover these highlights in the course of the interview. And, uh, you know, I need to qualify that my friend and guest prefers to fly under the radar. So to say yes to being a guest on the wheel print is a step out of his comfort zone. And I appreciate it very much. He has a strong story to tell. I want to welcome. Miles Thompson to the Wheel Print Podcast. Welcome, Miles. What up? <laughs> Greetings, David. Glad to be here. Uh, it's funny you say I like to fly under the radar. I just don't like to get on airplanes anymore. So I live in my own private Idaho now here in, in Southern California, which is its own story. But uh, yeah, it's it's funny. After... My time in Great Britain and 25 years of being a head coach, uh, anonymity became a friend. And being like the low, mo the low man on the totem pole out of my local break instead of, you know, the head coach making the decisions was like the perfect transition for me. So, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Well, we're going to get into that a little bit into the course of things and more detail. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you're definitely a back to your roots and Southern California is your lifestyle. Uh, and what's great about you and I is that we have so many commonalities with that lifestyle, uh, which really makes this interview, I think, quite easy for me anyway. Uh, and we're going to start with, uh, the basics, like where'd you grow up in Southern California? Now the similarities, since we've been working together for the last few years, um, are spooky, you know, <laughs> grew up in, yeah. grew up in Hollywood, but at what, at about a age of 11 moved to Costa Mesa and, uh, you know, strawberry fields and orange groves, as far as you could see down Harbor Boulevard. But, but, you know, you're like seven years older than me, but it, it ends up after we start having conversations, we played basketball at the same boys club. We played little league baseball at T Winkle park. Right. Uh, we went to the same beach, rode the same waves as kids. You know, I was just seven years behind you. And, uh, you know, that part of it to me was, you know, it's serendipitous and i go yeah there's a reason that you know we're going to talk about it later I, I suppose but so there's a reason that i work on this project with you because the similarities again are just spooky 
Yeah. And great. And it's great because it brought me back to some really memories that uh, not necessarily forgotten, but, you know, sort of steamrolled over with everything else you're doing professionally. And it was nice to go back to times of, you know, the bluff of Costa Mesa, Superior Hill of Newport Beach, you know, and all the shenanigans of the 70s. And yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah. So when you and I talk of Costa Mesa, the bluff, Newport, you know, uh, Charlie's Chili, whatever it is. Uh, the crab cooker. No, what is not too many. Not too many other people gonna really know what we're yeah. talking about. But this is something that we were very familiar with. And uh, as we both grew up in Costa Mesa, uh, and you know, was that was that where y- you mentioned the Boys Club and T Winkle Park, even even the baseball park across from the Boys Club. Yep. You know, um, but is that where your sports began or did it start even sooner than that? In, uh, uh, it started like when we lived in Hollywood, I lived my mom, single parent, and uh, she worked for the district attorney and, and they had season tickets for the Dodgers. So. You know, I was a little kid. I was eight, nine, ten, eleven, and you know, in the the crappy games that all the highfalutin lawyers didn't want to go to, they gave it to my mom. You know, the legal secretary, and so and she would take me. So it wasn't. It was pretty common for like on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, you know, to go to Dodger Stadium and, and catch a ball game. And I just fell in love with it. I just fell in love being in that environment. You know, and there's a lot of firsts. Like I saw my first fist fight. You know, at Dodger Stadium, I, you know, I saw, you know, how the fans treated Pete Rose of, you know, the Cincinnati Reds, you know, it was, they treated him with contempt. And then I saw all the joy that, uh, you know, the Dodgers brought not only me, but the fans. And then there was Vin Scully. And, you know, people don't know Vin Scully is he's just the classic voice of the Dodgers that just transcends and brings it to life and just a classic storyteller. So I was in, I was yeah. in, and then we, I didn't live that far from where, from where the Rams played. You know, I got to see a few of their games, got to see a lot of UCLA football, some UCLA basketball, you know, and it was, it was an amazing time during, during the seventies in Southern California. All right. But when you first picked up a glove and a bat or a, a, a ball, was that Hollywood or was that Costa Mesa? Most of Mesa is where I started playing like organized sports. You know, yeah. Hollywood was playing in the yard, you know, playing with the with neighborhood kids. So yeah, Costa Mesa. And did you know, did you know you wanted to, that's something you wanted to continue to do uh, day after day? Um, I absolutely love sports. Uh, I just loved every aspect of it. You know, I love the announcing of it. I loved like the coaching of it, you know, like when I was a kid, I knew like John Wooden was something special. You know, I knew that I knew that Walt Alston for the Dodgers was was it was different and, a, and it was a quiet leader. And I and I love the numbers and I followed all the numbers, man. I just like I had a ton of baseball cards. My mom would come home. I was like a latchkey kid and the baseball cards would be all over the room. And it's funny when I when I got into coaching, uh, I didn't expect to get into coaching. But my mom, she like she was like, I always need to end up doing something in sport because she saw how into it and maniacal I was about the numbers in sports and how emotional I was and wins and losses, you know, as a tw- 11, 12, 13 year old kid. Yeah. I can see you with the program going with your pencil going inning by inning and keeping track. Still that guy. I'm still that guy. If I go to a ball game, I'm the old guy keeping score. You know, <laughs> and I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be happy. That's what makes me happy. All right, cool. Well, now we're gonna fast forward to our new life scenario. So, uh, how old were you when you got hurt? And uh, what year? 17 years old. 
1978, you know, fell asleep driving, trying to drive to Utah to go skiing with the snow club, with this, with the ski club. You know, I'd been in the ski club previous years, my senior year in high school, I wasn't in it, but there was a girl involved, you know, and uh, well, if I can get to that mountain, you know, I can go skiing, I can see this girl. And, uh, you know, it was a dumb 17 year old decision, you know, fell asleep somewhere around Vegas and, uh, you know, you just, you just wake up and, uh, you have a new reality. Yeah, there you have it. I mean, you, you've been in this world long enough. You've heard every story, you know, a few. uh, pretty much. So, all right. So, uh, I know a lot of the answers to the questions I'm asking, but I'm just going to ask them. So where did you do your rehab? That time it was cutting edge Rancho Los Amigos, you know, a county facility in Downey uh, was a place when I was there. They just recently filmed the Academy Award winning Coming Home, you know, and like I think they premiered it and I was though they didn't. I don't think that they premiered it when I was there. We all went into this big auditorium like room and watched this movie that ended up winning an Academy Award and uh a real like kind of depressing place because it was a county facility and you know you had the burn ward you had the drug war you had all these wards of whoa you know and i was 17 year old kids rolling around going man you know i actually got it pretty good compared to a lot of these people here and um but it was definitely the place where in 78 that i needed to be to do one meet the great Jeff Minterbreaker, who just changed my changed my reality right away. Uh, you know, met Eric Walls, start started to hear stories about you, you know, started to hear stories about this Ed Owen guy. And you're like, and right away, you know, I was it was right when the uh, aluminum chairs of Jeff's started to come out. And I wasn't even released from the hospital, and Jeff gave me a hand-me-down aluminum chair with about a back that high you know and i'm all like everywhere i push like this but you know i was i was part of it and it felt great yeah you're you're fortunate that your timing had you in a quadra you know a custom chair where the rest of us went home with a version of of hospital chairs that we stripped down like a in a body shop just cut everything off that we could uh but i want to qualify that i went to rancho los amigos the movie referred to by miles or was academy award winning with john boyd and uh jane fonda and i served as an extra in that that film <laughs> so when you were doing that whole thing i i was all up in in it as well uh, you mentioned Jeff Minnebreaker. He was your recreation therapist. Ed Owen would become the recreation therapist that led the wheelchair sports program. Ed is a Hall of Famer in the NWBA. And Eric Walls, one of the best laydown surfers. No, the best that the world has ever known. Most folks today uh, paddle surf and sit. Uh, but anyway, so that was a bunch uh, of classic characters, uh, and really, uh, like trendsetters, you know, Candy Cable was a big part of that time. You know, Greg Thompson started the Southern California Flyers. Super you know? cute. Yep. And we were just this group that did crazy stuff. Like we went to a 24 hour dance marathon at the Santa Monica Civic Center. You know, guys like Raul, who is just lightning quick in everything he did, it, he he was able to do in a chair and just classic, funny, uh, you know, landmark characters. Yeah. Raul's nickname was Coneco, which means rabbit, um, because he was so fast uh, with a big afro um, at that time. 
Performax, the sweet ride, is our lead sponsor of the Wheel Print Podcast. Performax has supported all that I do and has been so innovative to serving our community of wheelchair users. From the elite USA national team player to the rank and file wheelchair user, Performax delivers. Don't think twice about who to choose for your ride. Performax is the only choice when it comes to weight, function, and a great looking design. It's the right choice, trust me. With 25 years of experience, you won't regret making Performax your sweet ride. Let them know that the wheel print sent you. Well, look, let's fast forward a little bit. Now you're out of the, you know, you're out of the joint and the wards, and now you're back into uh, the Southern California lifestyle, trying to play the game with not much of a playbook, but you had good examples by the people that you uh, mentioned. Uh, but let's talk tennis because tennis became uh, something huge and you and I were both part of the birth of that. Can you speak to being uh, in the epicenter of adaptive sports in Southern California and that vibe? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, in that time in the late 70s, it was starting to, in my opinion, it was like awareness was starting to explode in Southern California. And I was all about it. I was, we played tennis five, six days a week. You know, we would just, because it was something that I didn't really know I was going to be able to do, you know, once I was released, you know, with my full body jacket. And then you get it off and you're like, okay, there's a lot of freedoms in here. Jeff Minnebreaker again, you know, kind of held my hand through things, took me to a first couple tournaments. And I was like, hey, all right, I'm pretty good at this. I can do this. And then, uh, you know, Brad Parks and National Foundation of Wheelchair Tennis wasn't right, right, right behind that. John Chambers, the great John Chambers, you know, put on some events in Griffith Park that I entered into. I believe you did too. And all of a sudden, when Brad got a hold of it with his resources and his connections, you know, and he was able to access a lot of sponsorship, a lot of dollars, and basically started what today is now a worldwide, you know, the 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 four majors events, you know, uh, and that's where it's that's where it's blossomed to from a bunch of uh, Southern California, you know, maniacs traversing Coast Highway, traversing, you know, Highway 10, Highway 5, North, South, East, West, to find a court where there was other Crips wanting to play the game. And uh, to be a part of that was a lot of fun. Yeah, lot of fun. I was, it was a lot great of characters. time. Great time. And you were one of them. You know, uh, Jeff was certainly an inspiration of mine as well. Uh, and he, he's the first person I played tennis with. John Chambers put on the first ever wheelchair tennis tournament at Griffith Park. Uh, Brad, again, was the impetus between all the growth that we see today with USTA, the ITA. Uh, it, and back then we were hanging with all the Hollywood celebs and, and the professionals, uh, from the USTA, uh, we were rolling. Yeah. So that time, you know, to end the subject pretty much on tennis, we, we were, we were playing one up one downs, which is a stand up player and a sit down tennis player with some of the highest level pros in the game uh with the usda uh brad had that all going on uh we had hollywood actors i mean we had uh really high profile uh people involved and it was so fun you know so uh and then you look at today's 
today's game, like you said, at every able-bodied major, there's a wheelchair division and they're making good money playing it. Uh, yeah. it it's really cool. Um, yeah, and I'd be a bit remiss if I didn't mention Dan Lockman because he was, Danny was my boy. Like we played, he had a court at his condominium in Huntington Beach. We played there all the time, like all the time. We played doubles together, every event, you know, won a couple events. And uh, he was my boy. So I got to say, you know, I got to say know. Danny Lockman was a big part of it. What up, Danny Lock, man? Yeah, you guys were formidable. You, you had the best chemistry probably of any uh, doubles team. Uh, your injuries were higher, and you're playing against lower-level spinal cord injured matching up. Uh, but that didn't often get in the way. You just had great chemistry of working together, and and you won more than a couple. I'm going to say that much. We, we enjoyed, it was a great time, and, like, we enjoyed our time off the court, too, you know. Well, good. Uh, well, look, um, talk to me about college and what your major was. Where did you go to school? Went to school in Chico State, the great Chico State. For people who've, who know Chico State, uh, it is an amazing place with tons of swimming holes in Northern California north of Sacramento in the Sacramento Valley. And uh, I almost graduated from Chico State. And, um, and uh, you know, I just, I had a job and I knew what I wanted to do. And I wrote, I was writing for the local newspaper there. And I was like, I don't, I don't need to finish my degree here. I've got my, I've got my plan. So I went with it and got in the writing game and the publishing game and, um, and I did that for about five years and loved it. And, and you know, the, the paper, the local paper, I was doing the uh, music reviews and feature writing, and they sent me on some really cool gigs and met some cool musicians. And, and you know, I got to go to San Francisco a lot to, to review bands. And, uh, but I was just desperately poor and decisions and needed a, you know, just needed a new, outlet so to speak and i just turned back to sport you know i had an option to uh transition to alabama and work at what was called camp aska and just reverted right back into sport became the uh, the camp's athletic director uh in about a year and a half's time was on uh lake martin you know had a ski boat at our disposal i was hanging out with champion water skiers so water skiing and sport and basketball, creating events for like all sorts of populations and uh, populations, able-bodied population being one of them. But, you know, you, if there was a disability I, population, I worked with it at Camp Asco and helped create events for them. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a really, Alabama was really good to me because I was, I was a bit of a lost soul and uh, to be in the woods of Alabama uh, on, on a pristine Lake Martin, about 40 minutes from Auburn, it was a place for me to be actually. And it was, it allowed me to, to reset, to get back, you know, into the, into the world, a more urban, a more urban setting, a more visible setting. And from there I became quite visible. Yeah, man. Well, I want to kind of just step back so everybody knows you you spoke of Chico State and that you started to write for the newspaper but what was your emphasis and or your plan major at the time I was an English major just cuz I knew that I liked to put words together yeah but I didn't have a plan David I, I yeah. was I was and I was loving life you know uh loving Chico loving the freedom of being away from home. And that was my major. My major was trying to cash checks with no money. You know, that's what my major was. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but, yeah. you know, but I, but through all that, I learned quite a bit about life and, 
And I wouldn't trade that time with anything, you know. Yeah. I was able to, you know, when the times got tough, my friend and I started a hot dog stand and it became really successful. You know, and it was something I'm like, what are we doing? Well, we're making money. That's all I know. And it was like, you know, I think we, at least for me, I had a period of my life that was a bit out of control, but also had a lot, lot of valuable lessons involved. Yeah, well, cool. Well, anyway, um, you, you, you know, which was next topic for me was the move to Alabama, Capasca. I knew knew of that. But then you transition to uh, Lakeshore uh, uh, through Hall of Famer, through the NWBA, Frank T. Burns. So uh, tell us about your time at Lakeshore and what you were able to do there and accomplish there. Yeah, was, Lakeshore was another just like a stepping stone for me, one, in coaching and then two as a professional uh, uh when i was at camp pasco i went to my boss there and said you know we did we need to do a wheelchair sports camp we have the facilities we have every we had because we had lodging we had everything it was a beautiful camp and so i made a call to lakeshore foundation unbeknownst that frank burns was the athletic director there he instantly says great idea let's do it uh, by the time the week's over, we run a successful camp. He asked me if I want a job in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, I accept. And one thing led to another, and I'm working with Kevin Orr in the kids department, you know. Uh, and Kevin Orr, I, I, I recently heard, is now the athletic director himself at Lakeshore Foundation. Yes. Which, which kudos to him, quality, quality human being. And uh, Kevin and I, he was my boss. We ran the kids program. And then one day, Frank pulled me into his office and says, I got this junior team. Will you coach it? And I'm like, junior team of what? He goes, basketball. And I go, I'm not a basketball coach, Frank. You know, I'm a tennis player. And uh, he goes, no, you're going to coach this basketball team. <laughs> and so I said, okay. I said, all right. And uh, little did I know the team he gave me was stacked. It was a great, it, it was like, we went to Arkansas, like four days later, I went to the team and said, you know, I'm in this situation where, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I know everything cause I don't, but I think the one thing we're going to do is just play hard all weekend and we'll just, you know, we'll deal with the bumps in the road as they come. And uh, we won the tournament and I came back home and I told Frank we won and he's like, you know, I've never gone to Arkansas and won a game. So, uh, it was just, it was very fortunate for me. One, that I had such a team, but two, that I was able right away to start relationships with people like Doug Garner, you know, because he, he was there coaching the Arkansas team that, you know, had uh, had McGee and two on it, you know, quality players. And uh, just kind of, it just kind of snowballed from there as far as relationship building becoming part of the junior uh, vice presidency, presidency part of thing, you know, and just building that junior division into, in my opinion at the time, was the best division in the NWBA. Yo, just a quick break here. I want to talk to you about a company that I want you all to check out. UMED is the official medical supply company of the Wheelprint Podcast, and it's the best way for you to get your supplies. This company was founded by my very good friend, Yasmin Bamberg, who has used a wheelchair for over 24 years and has real on the street experience. His team knows exactly what you need and how to get it to you. All products are delivered accurately and on time, and I can easily attest to this as I am a happy customer myself. They also know how to handle your insurance company and will fight for your coverage. Their customer service is simply elite. There is always a person to answer your calls and questions. Worry-free, UMED is the way to go. Contact Yaz at u-medinc.com to jump on board. Please mention the Wheel to Print podcast or my name, DK, and help ensure the future of this podcast while getting top shelf service from UMED. And who 
Who were the headliners on your team? Uh, at that time, I had a really young, uh, initially really young Jeremy Campbell, like 11 and 12 years old, you know, who who you can see was going to be quality. I had uh, an, a really good kid, an amputee named Jay Reed. Uh, then we brought on uh, Josh George as a class one. Uh, we brought on, you know, country uh, as, you know, it's he any rest in peace and uh and david robertson and we just it just kept building and i had this i just knew the more time we could spend together the better and lakeshore at that time hadn't built the new the new huge facility had this one nice little gym and we would have these weekend camps and sleep in the gym all weekend show up on friday night leave on sunday things were looser you know, yeah. so I was able to take advantage of that. And we spent a lot of time together learning, learning the game. Like I, I was learning it, they were learning it. And together, you know, we started to to win some games, won a couple championships. And then second time around, you know, had the likes of Brian Bell. Found, you know, we were lucky enough to find him and uh, and that team and Blake Lofton, Meredith Jett. Master Hinkle, Paul Morrell. I mean, those are those are that was a quality team, and uh, won won a championship with those guys. And and uh, yeah, Lakeshore was an amazing time. Yeah, I'll never forget. And I really loved it when it was before the big building, before Lakeshore became Whoa! and Lakeshore was just a, you know another another dot on the map, and. Uh, and when it became really big, it became, it had to become more corporate. It had to be, because it, it had to do its risk management. It, it, it had to, it had to take care of its, its own back. And things became, couldn't get away with, you know, yet, you know, I was, I couldn't drive to go pick up players like I used to in my car. And, and I was like, all right, there's, this, this might be time for me to, you know, think about what's next. Well, and that big building you described today is the U.S. Paralympic and Olympic exactly. Training Center, uh, which, you know, is just a, a a benchmark in our history. And of the fact that we could say Paralympic before Olympic has never been done. All the design was done to accommodate those with disabilities. So it was, it, it, it's the flagship program and pretty much still is today, you know, uh, and you were able to cut your teeth in such a place as a coach. And that kind of led you and me down the road to 2009. And that's where I was appointed the USA women's head coach job. Uh, I'd done a couple other uh, stints as in coaching. And um, particularly, I, I kind of knew I wanted to do women and not men. Uh, but I, I was somewhat intimidated because I was that player uh, that had the resume, but I was not the coach that had the resume. And what you did for me when I asked you and you were willing to be a, an assistant going into the world championships is what we were embarking on. Uh, you brought structure, you brought uh, all kinds of strategy. Uh, and I became a better coach by allowing myself to listen to what you had versus I'm the head coach. Uh, I, I've always said a great player does not make a great coach. You know, you had time in the saddle. Uh, you left Lakeshore. You went to Alabama, the University of Alabama. And you did it again. Talk about that briefly. That was, uh, that move was, 
intense because I had gone ahead and it was tough because I loved working with Scott Douglas for one. He was my boss. He was the athletic director. You know, he, him and I like were part of the, did part of the drawings, you know, or not didn't do the drawings, but we said, no, oh, we need a big storage room in this building, you know, for the chairs and working with Scott was great. But for, it was about three years there. I had this, you know, I, I basically rented the tennis center from Lakeshore and started our, started my own tennis academy. Uh, and, you know, I was a business. I was a small businessman, still coaching Lakeshore uh, uh, as a part-time cut as on, as a part-time job. And, and, uh, and then Brent Harden and Margaret Strand knocked on the door, called me and said, what do you think? We want to start a program for the men's team at Bama. They'd already started one for the women's team, I think three years previous, because they very, you know, two really intelligent people knew that there was more grants more opportunities, more to start a program at the at a major university like Alabama through the women's side of things. So they started the women's side first, and then they hit me up to start the men's side, and uh, I accepted. But I still had this full time, uh, you know, tennis obligation. And uh, for there was about two years though that there wasn't enough hours in the day, and I would. I would go down to Alabama from six in the morning till nine in the morning, drive back 40 minutes, work at the work at the tennis facility from nine till six, you know, then do it all over again. And it was, I was wearing myself a little thin. So then I, we, we sold the tennis part of it with a partner and um, then it was straight capstone rolled tide. Let's go Tuscaloosa, you know, and, uh, and, to start a program, the, the collegiate program from scratch, that's a tough road. You know, you got a lot of humble pie to swallow. Because one, I was in, I was entering in the league with Frogley, Chenoweth, you know, Coach Jim Hayes, you know, coaches that are, in, and also diabolical, you know. And uh, we took it on the chin for a while. And then around the third, fourth year, and then when I was able, we were able to recruit Jerry Rambula. We, uh, that was a big, that was a big, that was a big moment for the men's program. And, uh, you know, I think six years in, seven years in, you know, we won a national championship. And like, I couldn't be like, that was something else to it. Cause there was the competition, it's a small league. But the competition is just fierce in the collegiate division, right? And uh, and especially at that time, and I'm sure it is now. I'm I'm a little detached from that from that now, even though I think the proudest, best accomplishment I have is my two former players, Ford Bertram on the men's side and Ryan Hines on the women's side, are now the two head coaches at the University of Alabama, and just excelling and great people yeah. purple great people her persons and winning winning a lot of basketball games yeah. so it was it was alabama was amazing uh and it would have been really easy to just ride it all the way through there still be there but it just wasn't in me you know i'm not from the deep south i love the deep south but it wasn't just in me to, 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 to end up in the deep South into my retirement age. Yeah. Well, and a national collegiate championship to your name, right? Yeah, we got one. We got one when I was there. I think yeah. Ford's going went ahead and won three or four. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, Alabama just continues to dominate and win year after year. Uh, you're surprised when they don't, which rarely happens. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, that that decision I made to ask you to be part of the national team uh, staff uh, had everything to do with what I knew you were doing at the university. 
because I needed someone that could help me provide the structure. And I can't thank you enough. Uh, we also had Dan Price, another college coach, uh, Matt Bushy, another college coach. Um, and we, we were formidable. We, we went into the world championships after Canada had won 24 years in a row. And, uh, and we beat Germany for the world championship. We go into 2012 basically with the same staff and we are world number one and we are in the semifinal. It's a long story that I don't want to totally bring up, but there was a last second call that, that eliminated us from the gold medal game by an official uh, that was by video proven uh, just to be a, a, a really bad call uh, and we should have won that game on a Elena Nichols put back <laughs> uh, but anyway all right so we do the whole thing and we end up we end up fourth which to a U.S. team uh, that doesn't sit well never will I mean even even a bronze medal doesn't set well with with me but a medal is a medal and you need to get one. Uh, so after 12 miles, a huge change happens. You move to Great Britain and tell us why. It was uh, the journey, you know, the adventure. I was down with it. I was like, and the women's game. I hadn't, you know, I had... I had, you know, a little dalliances with it on the international level, but I hadn't been entrenched, you know, embedded with the women's game. And, uh, and right away, I just, I knew this, I knew that the Great Britain team had a ton of talent, you know, and I just, there was a, there was a, a connectivity that needed to happen there. And I was hoping that I could help bring that together. And, uh, you know, it was, it went from being a job where I looked at him when, you know, I was proud, I was coaching three players, you know, and that was, that was all the players that were, that were centrally located at this place. till we got to the place where we had 17 players centrally located, you know, and we got on a podium in 2018. It's first, the women, GB women's first and only podium. I believe at a world championship or Paralympic level. And, uh, you know, and now they're off and cooking. Now they're, now they're doing their thing. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I expect nothing but great things from, from them, uh, uh at major, at major tournaments. Yeah. What a, what a wonderful wheel print so far. And you're not finished. Uh, you're certainly finished in the coaching side and, and leaving Southern Cal side, but that's the next combo. And I'll, you know, perhaps give the clip notes version, but you've told me and you're, you're committed for life to where you're at in Southern California and surfing has become your addiction, your passion, uh, and Pippa, your wife's doing it with you. It's a lifestyle. So, Tell us just briefly about what's going on there, Miles. Yeah, it's uh, I'm just super stoked, super happy. M maybe the happiest I've ever been in my life. No, I am the happiest I've ever been in my life. You know, to be in my mid sixties. You know, I'm a local down at Santo Dog Patch. Everybody knows me. Um, uh, we've there's a there's a cart system. It's really easy to get in and out of the water. You know, and that's the biggest bug and boo. It's just getting in and out. Once you're on the water, you know, the shaper, I have a shaper who knows me, shapes my boards. And uh, two to two to four, sometimes five times a week, we're in it. And like last week, there was a bigger swell, you know, and you just take your lumps. And then you, and you have that one magic carpet ride 
And it's just, you pick a line and you come out the other end and you just say, I don't believe I just did that. And you're just stoked and jacked for about a day and a half that stays with you. And it's like, it's just like mainlining, mainlining espresso back to back to back to back to back. And <laughs> I can't do it enough. And I'm just, you know, I grew up doing it. I used to have dreams, you know, all the time I was coaching, I always had this dream about a point left. I'm going to surf a point left. And right on. So I'm just. Yeah, it is a lifestyle. You're right. Like our lifestyle is, you know, a coastal lifestyle means you live in a smaller house. We live in a 900 square foot house. Coastal lifestyle means you ride your bikes a lot. We ride our bikes down to the beach, down the trail, go to Doheny, you know, look at the boats, you know, look at the, just, it's a coast. It is a true lifestyle that I always knew was who I really was. And uh, not that I wasn't ever a true coach, but this is who I was. This is what I was born to do and where I was born to do it. Yeah. Well, what would all coaches transition into something else eventually, you know, without all the day in and day out grind, uh, I would call it. So I'm, I'm pretty jealous of your lifestyle knowing Southern Cal like I do. And, and, uh, yeah, it's quality. You know, I left it for 40 years, it took me 40 years of, chasing everything else and uh you know I we really came back to look after my elderly mother you know and make sure everything's good with her and um uh, and it's led to all, all this and it's been it's a real blessing yeah that's beautiful miles um all right we're to the point now where we get to talk about <laughs> something we've been cooking up for the last two two and a half years and uh, that's when I brought up to you that I committed to myself to, to do my life story or autobiography or whatever we want to call it. Uh, and I said, I just can't get off my hands, uh, to start, you know, and you said, well, I got a little writing background and. And uh, if you would like some help, I don't know if you knew exactly what you were saying at that moment, but uh, as far as two and a half years, uh, but you and I uh, have, I've told this story and you have written it. Why don't you tell our listeners here, uh, it's our last real topic, uh, give them an update of where we're at right now with uh, this manuscript. Well, uh, Wheelhead is the title, uh, the wheel print of David Kiley. And we're, we are to the point now where it, it's at the editor. And uh, we spent, I want to say it was three years, David. And uh, we, <laughs> spent, <laughs> we spent, we uh, spent uh, three years putting together 300 plus pages of the story of you and because you got the stories man you you are a living breathing history of what so many are doing now within disability sport you know uh when putting this together and talking to you and then writing about it you know it just it, it just it really blows me away that you're a part of history of so many sport of so much of disability sport from basketball, of course, but also track and field and snow skiing and, you know, and, and then all the 70s sort of subterranean stuff, like, like the, uh, the downhill races at Jack Murphy stadium in San Diego, the blister bowl in the parking lot in Isla Vista and Santa Barbara. I mean, those are classic had to be there. What are we doing moments? And you were like, you were the top dog. You were the kick-ass guy. And 
you know, and your stories through from then until the man you are now, that arc is a story that is historical, uh, but it's also relevant. It's funny, you know, it's heartbreaking. And, uh, and, and, and we did it. Me and you did it, man. We did it. It's to the editor now, you know, and they they might be brutal with us and they might say, no, we're going to change this, this, and this, and this. Uh, but we did it. And uh, we should be proud of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and how could we not be? Uh, it, it, it was definitely, in your words, blood on the pages. You know, we worked Wheeler hard and and consistently within our own life t schedules, which are bizarre. Uh, you particularly taking care of your mom and, and, uh, and surfing. If the waves were up, Miles, the author, the, the writer was, was gone. And I knew that it wasn't a big deal. And, and I'm still doing enough that I was taken away, but you know, you're, creative style uh your your worksmith wordsmith uh ability uh has edge and i wanted edge in my my story i didn't want a chronological accomplishment this that and then a hundred pages of everything i did and i didn't want that um, there's plenty of those out there and I'm not trying to discredit them, but, uh, this book, because it's 300 plus pages without photos yet, which will really, uh, explain a lot visually, uh, but it's the good, bad, and the ugly in, you know, I was vulnerable and, uh, you brought that out of me and, um, uh, you know, we found the publisher and, and, um, uh, now, like you said, we're in the editing process and there's probably an audio book coming, but to everyone out there, what, whatever y y you think, and if you're interested, we'll have a book soon. We'll have a website soon and, uh, and it'll be in some bookstores. Um, so we're excited and proud and we'll keep everyone uh involved uh with that discussion so kind of in, in closing miles you got any parting words we already talked lakers dodgers uh no we didn't talk yeah we yeah, always we, talk lakers dodgers so yeah like every, that's, just that, a that's our thing. first that's our first discussion uh true that so uh, and I love that, that banter that we have, uh, but do you have any closing, uh, a parting you know, word about the book a lot these days? And, you know, we talked about like, it's not a glory project. It's not putting you on a pedestal and saying, look at this guy. He's the greatest that ever was. It's a, it's a, it's a book based on trust and truth and one thing I've learned through coaching all through 25 years is the truth is, is slippery at best. And like, we decided to really grapple with the truth and that's a really, it could be a really difficult thing to do. You know, a lot of people, one don't want to do it or don't really know how to do it. And, uh, and together, I think we, we tell, we tell a really honest true story yeah uh, i agree and uh, i can't wait to be holding it you know holding the manuscript in its rough form uh is is a beautiful thing but i can't wait to have the real deal in my hands uh so anyways miles this has been a really good uh episode and easy been easy i thought it'd be hard man we we're just talking. No, no, that's 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 the beauty of it. And I knew it was going to go down like that. So anyways, in my closing, I uh, I'm going to thank you very much uh, for being willing 
And uh, I want to let everyone know that May 11th and 12th, DK3 is being carried on after 20 years by the infamous Matt Scott at Venice Beach, the iconic courts. So mark your calendar. And if you're a Southern Californian person or you uh, want any involvement in this tournament, you you can uh, volunteer. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be such a cool event. And I wanted to get that out. So I want to thank our sponsors and particularly you, our listener. Encourage you to share this podcast on uh, on your social. We're on Apple, Spotify and the YouTube channel. So keep it out of the ditch, my people. Do the next right thing and be a good human being. I hope you enjoyed today's show on the Wheel Print Podcast as much as I did. I invite you to check out our other episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on our YouTube channel. Thank you to our lead sponsor, Performax Wheelchairs, The Sweet Ride. They are the leaders of wheelchair design worldwide. And to our new sponsor, UMED. Special thanks to Ishtan Yeri of Dromos, our lead producer of this show.